speaker today is uh, Lucy Moser Jocelyn, um, and she'll speak on forms of almost homogeneous varieties. Please okay. go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I'd first like to thank the organizers for organizing this uh, virtual seminar and inviting me to speak. And I'd also thank, like to thank all of you for, for joining. Um, I am going to be talking on work that is in collaboration with Ronan Terpereau on forms of almost homogeneous varieties. Uh, this topic is part of a larger uh, uh, investigation done by several people on equivariant forms of varieties that have an action of the group. And the idea is to study the forms that are compatible with the action. Uh, and the, what happens for the almost homogeneous case, as in for some other cases, is that we can, we can um, classify almost homogeneous varieties by some kind of combinatorics, which I will tell you about. And uh, using the combinatorics, we will try to find uh, forms for over fields that are not algebraically closed. That's the, that's the goal. Um, uh, everything I talk about today uh, is in a preprint that we recently posted on archives, and I give you on this page the address of the, of the preprint. Um, it was posted in August, I think, in August. Okay, so let's begin. I will start. I think I will start if I can figure out how to move it. Oh, yes. Um, I'll start by explaining a little bit more in detail what the question is. You take K, a perfect field, with a given algebraic closure, K bar, and G, I will be interested in the case where G is a connected reductive group over the algebraic closure K bar. Now an almost homogeneous variety, for me, will always be a normal variety. I'll explain to you why later. And it's a normal G variety that has an open dense orbit. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah. Why does it not move? Yes. And now, the problem that we are interested in is given an almost homogeneous G variety X, find all K forms on X which are compatible with a given K form on the group. Okay, okay that's the question. And now, what I'm going to explain to you is what I mean by compatible. So, first, I will define forms on X and on G. So we'll talk about k-forms and descent data. So uh, a k-form of an algebraic group, G, which is an algebraic group over k-bar, is an algebraic group over k, together with an isomorphism where f, if you extend the field to k-bar, you get an isomorphism to G. In other words, it's, uh, uh, if k is real and k-bar is the complex, I'm saying that the complexification of f is G. Okay. No, it doesn't. Okay. Now, if I have a G variety X, I can look at K forms on X and I want them to be compatible with, the, with, a, with a given K form on the group. In other words, I define a KF form on a J variety, G variety, where, uh, and that's defined to be an F variety that also has a similar isomorphism uh, over the field K bar, and such that this isomorphism respects the action of F K bar defined on the Z K bar. All right. Somehow it doesn't like to change. Now this can also be described instead of with forms with descent data. So I will go back and, and do the same uh, thing looking at descent data on G and on X. So a descent datum on a group G is a continuous uh, um, gamma action where gamma is the Gallo group. Uh, it's a gamma action on G such that the action of each element of gamma is, uh, induces the given action on K bar from the Galois theory, from the Galois action. Okay. And two descent data are equivalent 
if there's a group, a K bar group automorphism psi, which conjugates globally one of the descent data to the other. Now we could do the same thing for a G variety. If you take a G variety and a given descent datum on G, we can define a G rho descent datum on X and it's a continuous gamma action on X that satisfies two conditions. The first condition is, a, uh, is, is the compatibility condition that the action of gamma semi-commutes with the action of, of G. In other words, that if, if mu gamma is the action of gamma on GX, it's given by rho gamma of G times mu gamma of X, compatible. Mm -hmm. Also, I want mu to be a descent datum on X, meaning that the action of mu on X is, uh, induces the, uh, the given action of gamma on the uh, algebraic closure K bar. Mm -hmm. Here also, two descent data, mu1 and mu2, are equivalent if they're conjugate by uh, this time an automorphism of x that's g equivariant for all gamma. Uh, and and the, 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 we have the conjugation condition for all gamma. Okay, why is this thing here? Okay, now, descent data give rise to k forms. For a group, if you have a descent datum on G, the quotient by the action of gamma on G gives a K form on G. And also all K forms arise in this way. In, in, in other words, also if two uh, descent data are equivalent, it means that the, the, form, the K forms are isomorphic. For a G rho descent datum on a variety X, the same uh, type of structure happens, except that one has to add a condition on X. When you look at a descent datum on X, we consider the quotient. For the way I define a form, I want it to be a variety. And for, for X, for the quotient to be a variety, I have to add a condition that X is covered by gamma stable affine open subsets. If this is the case, then again, I have uh, uh, the, the, um, this duality that a descent datum with this condition gives me a K form and all K forms of G of X, this should be an X arise as the quotient of X by the action. I'm sorry, this, this G should be X. Okay. Okay. So um, before explaining how we uh, do this uh, do this study, I'm going to talk about some related works. It's certainly not exhaustive, but just uh, other people who have studied this problem in in different uh, different settings. Uh, I, uh, Uruguay in 2011 2012 did his thesis and wrote some papers after on the case of toric varieties and spherical varieties. These are special cases of almost uh, homogeneous varieties. And in particular, in order to study these, uh, th these, um, these K-forms, he, uh, he defined an action of the Galois group on the combinatorial data given by toric varieties or spherical varieties. We will be using this uh, action uh, that he defined in the more general set setting of almost homogeneous uh, varieties in, in a little bit. Um, other people who have work, worked on different uh, aspects of spherical varieties, there's Vedhorn, he, uh, and Kupit Futu with Akizer looked at real forms of certain spherical varieties, and with uh, Timoshev, real orbits of complex spherical homogeneous spaces. So these are more the real setting, this is general and spherical varieties. And Bovoy and Gagliardi have several papers where they study very general, the very general situation of forms on G varieties. And they have specific results for spherical varieties. Finally, uh, uh, Terpero and myself have uh, two special cases of spherical varieties over the, over the reals that we studied. One is the horospherical real case, which we 
looked at with Borovoy and also the symmetric real varieties. Okay, so uh, we want to look at uh, uh, X, an almost homogeneous G variety with an open orbit, and the open orbit is isomorphic to a homogeneous space, say G over H. And we want to figure out how to determine all the K forms on X that are compatible with a K form on G. So if we just say very globally what we have to do, there are three steps. First, find all descent data rho on G. Uh, second, for each descent data that we found on G, find all G rho descent data mu on the open orbit. Finally, determine which of these descent data on the open orbit extend to the descent datum on X. Now, uh, in this, for the purposes of this talk, I will not say anything about the first case. And I will only say a few words about the second. What really interests me is this, this last part, how to tell when descent datum on the open orbit extends to descent datum on the almost homogeneous variety. Uh, one has to be careful because it is perfectly possible, and I will show you an example later, to have two descent data on X that are not equivalent, but when you look at them on the open set, they are equivalent. So it's not enough just to look at all the equivalence classes on the open set and see which ones extend. You have to really look at all of them. Okay, so I will start by just saying a few words about the homogeneous case and then I'll go into the heart of the problem and look at what happens for this last part of uh, extensions to the, to the almost homogeneous variety. So for the homogeneous case, we have G over H, a homogeneous variety, and uh, descent datum rho given on G. The first question is, does there exist a G rho descent datum? On the, on, on the homogeneous case? And the answer is yes, if one can find a continuous map T from the Gallo group to G, that does two things. First of all, we need that for each gamma, the rho gamma of H must be conjugate to H and T gamma conjugates H to this image. And the, the, this continuous map satisfies this cohomology condition on, uh, on um, for the T gamma one, gamma two has to belong to rho gamma one, T gamma two, T gamma one H. Mm -hmm. If such a T gamma exists, then one can define uh, uh, a, a um, a, K, uh, a descent datum on G over H just by sending H to T gamma H. Since um, th that of course determines the, the, uh, the automorphism and, uh, and then we have mu gamma G H is rho gamma G T gamma H. In particular, if gamma stabilizes H, then there's always a, a, a a G rho descent datum that just comes from choosing T gamma being uh, one always. And so that's a, a special case. And that just means that mu gamma is induced by rho gamma. Um, then if there exists at least one of these uh, descent data, then we can find all of the equivalence classes by looking at the first cohomology set with uh, of gamma with coefficients in the automorphism group of G over H and the automorphism group of G over H is the normalizer of H over H. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens in the homogeneous case. And if we want to talk about forms rather than descent data, the 
the quotient g over h is always quasi-projective, meaning that the second condition on this descent data is always verified, meaning that each of these descent data that I, one finds uh, using the first cohomology group gives rise to a form of GH, uh, which is compatible with the form on G coming from Rho. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about the homogeneous case. And now I'm going to go to what happens in the almost homogeneous case. Okay, so I told you vaguely what an almost homogeneous variety is, but now I'll be a little bit more specific. First of all, uh, as I said before, I'll be only looking at normal G varieties and G will be a reductive connected K bar group. An almost homogeneous variety will be a G variety uh, with an open orbit. And I want to fix an isomorphism of the open orbit to a homogeneous space G over H. So I have this isomorphism of G over H with an open orbit. This is to fix a, a base point in the open point being the image of H and will allow us to identify the field of functions on G over H with the field of functions on X. Now, some examples of almost homogeneous varieties, toric varieties, spherical varieties. Now, in toric, toric varieties are well known. Uh, they are, are um, classified by combinatorial objects called fans. Uh, spherical or varieties are also classified by combinatorial objects, which I will be getting into in a moment. Uh, and I will give a definition of spherical variety right now, which uses the concept of complexity. If you have a G variety X, we define the complexity to be the minimum co-dimension of a B orbit in X where B is a Borel subgroup of G. Okay, so this uh, concept is, is quite important in the study of the, of, um, of G varieties where G is reductive. Um, complexity zero simply means that I have a variety that has an open B orbit. If it has an open B orbit, then it has an open G orbit and it is almost uh, homogeneous. So, so, sorry, I have a question. I yes. have a question, uh, Lucy. Uh, yes. When you are talking about complexities, is that over K bar? Yes. K bar, over K bar. It, uh, Okay, okay. K bar, everything here is over K bar, All right? Okay, right. thank you. Okay, so complexity zero means that B has an open orbit and that is what the definition of a spherical variety is. It's a, it's a G variety where a Borel subgroup has an open orbit. But there are other examples of, of, uh, uh, of ho almost homogeneous spaces that are of higher complexity. The one that I will be interested in today and we'll talk more about at the later on in the talk is an example of a complexity one almost or a, a complexity one. I will look at almost homogeneous varieties where the group is SL2 and the variety is three dimensional. In other words, I'll be looking at uh, varieties that have an open orbit uh, that's uh, an equivalent, uh, it's a homogeneous space of the form SL2 modulo, a finite subgroup. Um, these are complexity one because the Borel subgroup in SL2 is of co-dimension one. Um, in 1983, uh, Lunan Wust wrote a paper which, which gave a remarkable classification by common torics of almost homogeneous varieties over an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero. The idea was to uh, imitate what happens in toric varieties and do something a little bit more general. I'll be talking quite a bit about what they did and how it works in a moment, but first let me explain how uh, this theory continued. 
uh, Timashev uh, in 1997, and then in a book that he wrote in 2011, uh, showed that these the classification that they gave works over any algebraically closed field, but algebraically closed. And he also studied more general G varieties, not only homo, almost homogeneous ones. Um, the key for, for what I will tell you is that the classification, I write this classification is effective when the complexity is zero or one. I don't mean a technical math term with effective. I mean simply that it can be done. If you have a variety of complexity zero one, this method that Luna and Voost have developed can be applied to find a reasonable description by combinatorics of almost homogeneous varieties. When the complexity gets bigger, the classification is theoretically possible, but is just too big to handle in a complete way. So um, I will tell you a little bit about how this theory that Lunan Vus developed um, works. Uh, so you take an almost homogeneous variety with open orbit G over H and fix a Borel subgroup B of G. The key to the theory is the fact that X is covered by B stable affine open subvarieties. This is a result due to Sumihiro. It, in, for toric varieties, for example, it uh, translates to the fact that any toric variety is covered by affine toric varieties. Because for a torus, the Borel subgroup is the whole group. But in general, you don't have G-stable ones, but you have B-stable ones. This means if I want to describe almost homogeneous varieties, I can describe them by looking at the possible way of it being covered by B-stable affine open orbits. Another way of saying this is to say, well, I will look at the orbits of the G orbits of X. For each G orbit, I can look at its closure. It's a, it has a local ring that's stable by G and these local rings will be described by objects that are, 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 um, that are semi-invariant for the B action. Okay, this is very vague and I'll try to be a little bit more specific now. Okay, so let's start. Let big K be the field of rational functions on G over H, which is of course the rational functions also uh, on X because X is, uh, is uh, G over H is open in X. And uh, uh, so this is over an algebraically closed field. We're doing everything on the over algebraically closed for a moment. Um, we define the G invariant geometric valuations on K. What does that mean? That means uh, any, if, any almost homogeneous variety that has open over G over H and has a G stable co dimension one uh, sub variety that has for, for this uh, G stable co dimension one uh, sub variety, it will have a valuation ring. And this is, is one of the valuation rings that, that will be there. So I'm looking in a certain sense on G stable uh, co dimension one sub varieties of X. Now, because of this fact of, well, I should say one more, more thing about Sumihiro. This, this fact is the reason that um, I stick to X being normal. The, the, this fact is no longer true if X is not normal. And that's why, why, why we use normal, you do it for normal varieties. Okay, so let's go back to where I was. I take my field and I look at the G invariant valuations, which correspond to uh, code of dimension one, G stable um, uh, sub varieties of almost homogeneous varieties having an open orbit G over H. But now we can't only look at G stable things, we have to look at D stable, the B stable things also. So I define, well, for, well I forgot this part, uh, any G stable 
geometric valuation is determined by its value on B semi invariance in the field. Right. Now, the B stable prime divisors, I define for G over H, I look at all the B stable prime divisors of G over H, and that gives me what I call the colors. Um, the colored equipment of G over H or of X will be these two sets, the G invariant valuations and the B stable prime divisors of G over H. So if I have an X, an almost homogeneous variety with open over G over H, I will choose a subset of each of these two sets, which will define my almost homogeneous variety. In other words, for each G orbit, Y of X, I consider a pair. First, a subset of G stable, uh, uh, of, of G invariant geometric valuations and of B stable prime divisors. The G stable prime, the, 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 the G stable prime divisors that contain Y give rise to G invariant geometric valuations, which are called the YG. And the, the colors that contain Y in their closures are called the colors of Y. So each orbit gives me these two subsets of, uh, of, the, of the colored equipment. And the, the, uh, the, the classification given by Lunan Boost says that the colored data of X is the collection of pairs. Each orbit com, uh, com, corresponds to a pair. And the result of Luna and Boost theory is that the colored data determines X. Now there's a whole other part of this theory that I'm not getting into here to say which collections of pairs are possible. Uh, and when do they give the same variety? And when do they give something that, uh, when do they, um, yeah, when, you know, what, what are the conditions to make, uh, uh, make them realizable for an almost homogeneous variety? This can be done. It's a list of conditions, but for the purposes of this talk, I don't need them. And so I won't talk about them here, but it is, it is a very important part of the theory. It says, it says, the set of almost homogeneous uh, varieties having G over H as an open set is in bijection with colored data satisfying a list of conditions. Okay, so that's the colored data on X. Now we're going to go back to what Urogan did for the spherical varieties and toric varieties and uh, define a gamma action on the colored equipment. So uh, to do this, uh, you have G, fix the descent datum rho on G as usual, and a descent datum mu on G over H. And this, this rho and mu will define an action on the colored equipment. The action of gamma on K, uh, is something that's a standard, is the standard action by looking at the action. We have an action on G over H coming from the descent data mu. And we look at gamma applied to a function on G over H being applied to X, just being gamma F of mu gamma inverse of X. This makes it easy to define an action on the G stable varieties, uh, G stable valuations, gamma of V applied to a rational function f is just v of gamma inverse on f. The action on the colors is a little bit more delicate because, well, for, 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 the, for, for the g stable valuations, it's easy to see that if v is g stable, gamma v is also g stable. So it works. If we try to do the similar thing on the colors, you take D that's B stable and you just 
used this uh, action uh, from the field, you won't get a divisor that's stable by B. So what you do, uh, you use the fact that all Borel subgroups are conjugate. So, so look at rho gamma B, it's conjugate to B, and pick uh, an element, depending on gamma, which conjugates B to rho gamma B. Then we can define the action of gamma on D by looking at the action on the valuation determined by D. In other words, when you take gamma times V, that's a divisor that gives rise to a valuation on the field K, and I want V of gamma D of F to be V of D on gamma inverse E gamma F. This is the thing that changes. Um, just let me remark that E gamma is unique up to a multiplication on the right by an element of the Borel subgroup. So this action is well-defined. And the other thing is that this uh, gives gamma D is now B stable. Thirdly, if you go back and see what we did for the G stable, if you do the corresponding um, uh, definition here on the valuations that are G stable, you get exactly the same thing that you had before. So these are three things that are compatible. Mm -hmm. Now we have, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, state the main theorem. Uh, X, if X is an almost homogeneous G space with a given uh, bijection between the open orbit and G over H, a homogeneous space, we pick rho, a descent datum on G, and mu, a G rho descent datum on the homogeneous space G over H. Then mu extends to a unique descent datum on X, if and only if the colored data of X is stable under the given action of gamma. If it exists, then X over, X over gamma is a form of, of X, if and only if X is covered by open gamma stable affine subsets. Well, gamma stable affine uh, is the same as quasi projective. And so that's, that's the main result. Okay. So that tells us how, how we can, uh, solve the problem uh, of finding all K forms on, on a almost homogeneous G space, a G variety. I, you, you start with uh, finding all the possible rows, all the possible mu's, and then you look at the Luna Vus data, look at the gamma action on it, and then see if it's stable. Okay, so what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is look at a particular example because that's all a little bit abstract, hard to, hard to follow where it is. So I'm going to do it for a special case. Mm -hmm. So for the special case, I'm going to pick the, the field K to be R and its algebraic closure to be C and G is SL2C. Um, so the Gallo group has two elements and this makes the descent datum much easier to define because uh, it only has one non-trivial element. So descent datum is just given by an anti-regular involution. On G, there as a group, there are two real forms. So I note them here by looking at the set of real points. It's either SL2R or SU2. And the two de descent data or equivalence classes are given by sigma s, which sends any matrix to its complex conjugate, or sigma c, which sends the matrix to complex conjugate inverse transpose. S stands for um, split, and c for compact. And sigma c is, a, is actually a, an inner twist of sigma s, but I won't use this here. Okay, so those are the two possible um, anti-regular um, involutions on the group. Uh, I'm interested to the, in the 
almost homogeneous three-dimensional case. So H will be a finite subgroup. <coughs> now the finite subgroups of SL2 are well known. They come in different types. Uh, type AN are cyclic, TN are binary dihedral, E6 is binary uh, tetrahedral, E7 binary octahedral, and E8 is binary icosahedral. Um, the nice thing for this case is up to conjugacy, we can always assume for either of these uh, descent data that sigma preserves H. Uh, and therefore, there's a, a given descent data on, uh, on, the, on the homogeneous space just coming from sigma itself. And then I can find all the equivalence classes by looking at this cohomology set. Therefore, we can calculate this group of uh, normalizer or H and then find all the equivalence classes. So, the, so that, that's how you do the homogeneous case. <coughs> now, we want to do the case of almost homogeneous varieties. In, in other ways, we have to look at the, um, the data given by the Lunar-Vus theory, the colored equipment. Now, to define the colored equipment on this case, I fix a Borel subgroup. Here I fixed a Borel subgroup that is uh, a tri lower triangular. And I'll start by looking at the colors. The colors are B-stable prime divisors of G over H. So they're in by ejection with G over B modulo H. So it's just a projective complex line modulo H. Okay, now for the uh, valuations, I'm going to start by looking at the special case where H is, the, is trivial, it's just the identity. Now for each divisor D, and in, that's, a, that's a color, that's B stable, we can cho choose a function on X whose zero set is just D. In other words, F of D on a matrix is going to be linear on the two uh, upper variables X and Y. So it's of the form alpha X plus beta Y. Uh, remember that the set of valuations that are G stable is determined by the by its values on the semi-invariance for B. And in this case, since the semi-invariance all come from these uh, functions FD, we can determine any valuation by its values on this set of, 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 um, of functions for D in P1. This is a P1. Now notice that these forms are linear. So if you have a valuation on these forms, they're all going to be the same, except maybe one of them. And also one can show that they're the valuation on, on, the, on all but possibly one, it has to be negative. So I'm going to uh, read this carefully with you. If you have a valuation that's G stable, you can normalize the valuation so that on all but possibly one of these forms, it's, its value is minus one. And then on the last one, it'll be a value R, which will be rational, and at least minus one. It turns out that it can't be bigger than one. And so this, it always will have a valuation on one particular uh, FD zero, which is R between minus one and one. And for all the others, it's minus one. Now we have defined BG and we find defined DB. We give a notation to this valuation, we'll call it V alpha beta, which is an element of the projective line, R. And here, alpha beta determines the element FD0. Now, what's the action? The action of gamma is induced by the action on G over gamma over B, which is the projective line. In other words, for the colors, Sigma S of the color defined by alpha beta is just the conjugate. And the fixed point set is P1 R. For the valuations, Sigma S on evaluation 
with uh, the point alpha beta here and R here is just conjugation on the P1 part and R stays the same. On for sigma C, one checks that the valuation on the, on the, uh, um, on the colors is given by alpha beta goes to beta bar minus alpha bar, and there are no real fixed points. Um, and sigma C on the valuations is uh, similar. Um, now, this is this I all did, did this always for the case of H being the identity. For the general H, the G invariant valuations are just restrictions of the, the valuations that I gave before to the invariants. And so I have my set of valuations and I have the actions. Okay, so I will just want to show you uh, two examples of how this how this theory works for for these uh, SL2 varieties. And to the first example will be where H is the identity. And to fix the action, I, will, I define Rn to be the uh, space of homogeneous n forms on two variables. In other words, the G representation space of dimension n plus one of SL2. And my first example will be of the, a space X, which will be a P2 cross P1, where the action of SL2 is given by R0 plus R1 here and R1 here. The I, G uh, maps into X by the matrix ABCD, just going to one ACBD. This is, this is easy to check that this is an almost homogeneous SL2 variety with an open orbit isomorphic to SL2. Um, I'll look at the orbits of this variety. Well, there's the open orbit. I'll start in the bottom, open orbit. Uh -huh. Then there are two dimension two orbits. They are not isomorphic. One of them is isomorphic to e A2 minus the origin. And the other one is P1 cross P1 minus the diagonal, it's affine. S1 is isomorphic to G modulo inverse. S2 is G modulo uh, unipotent. Then there are two one-dimensional orbits, each of them isomorphic to P1. One can check that the closure, the closures of S1 and S2 intersect in, let me hope I got it right, L1, and L2 is also in the closure of S2. Now, to describe this thing, I will give you a pi the picture of Lunavust for this variety and uh, describe certain things about it. So this is the picture. Okay, what is this? This is a starlight formation where, uh, which represents the G-stable valuations. Remember, I said that the V-stable valuations are given by picking an element in P1, that's picking a ray of the star, and then on the star, I pick a value between minus one and one. So the star gives the set of G-stable valuations. Now in this picture, for each orbit, I'm going to look at the G-stable valuations, which dominate the local ring of its closure. For example, if I take a co-dimension one subvariety, the ring, the local ring is a valuation and I get one valuation. For S1, I'm going to get just this valuation here. For S2, I'm gonna get just this valuation here. For the open orbit, I don't see it. It's, it's always uh, there and uh, it's not in the picture. And for uh, the, the one dimensional orbits, any valuation in this part of the diagram dominates the local ring of L1. For L2, any valuation in this part of the picture dominates uh, the local ring of L2. 
the plus sign indicates something about the color, which I don't want to get into here, but it's, it's, uh, it, it is important also for the classification. Um, now, what you can see here is that S1 and S2 have closures that intersect in L1, and L2 is in the closure of S2. So all that is the picture here. Now, what about the action of gamma? The action of gamma permutes the rays of the star. Now, if I want to have this picture be stable by something that permutes the rays, these two rays have to be fixed. There's no other ray that looks like this, no other ray that looks like this. So the only possibility is fixing these two rays. What does that mean? That means that any time that you have the uh, 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 gamma action, which fixes this diagram, it's going to fix each, or it's going to stabilize each orbit. Any anti-regular anti involution must stabilize each orbit. Um, for sigma s, well, this is possible because if you check these two lines, they are stable. This this will correspond to uh, to uh, to uh, um, a one one and the other to zero one. And so these two are stable, and uh, and uh, we get a g sigma s descent datum where the fixed points is just given by p two r cross p one r. However, for sigma c. Sigma C does not fix any element in P1. And therefore, there are no just J, G sigma C, C um, descent data on, uh, for, this, for this example. Now, we can say, luckily, that's the case. Because if we go back and look at um, the, the orbit of S2, S2 is an orbit that's isomorphic to G modulo U. And that's a homogeneous space that has no sigma C descent data, and therefore uh, it, it, it can't possibly have uh, it can't possibly be the be fixed by a sigma C descent data on the whole picture. Okay, that's so that's one example. Now I'll do a final example here, an example where H is plus or minus identity, um, and I'll look at X being a product of three copies of P one. Now this uh, case has uh, the open orbit, three two-dimensional orbits, and one one-dimensional orbit, the intersection of all of them. So we'll just look at that, the open orbit. Each of the, uh, the two-dimensional orbits are isomorphic to P1 cross P1 minus the diagonal. And um, the one-dimensional orbit is isomorphic to P1. So you see here that the three orbits of, of uh, dimension two are all isomorphic and a gamma action can permute them. Now, the result will be that gamma, the gamma action permutes these three orbits, the three orbits of dimension two, and there's uh, two inequivalent ways of doing this. You can either fix all of them or permute two and fix one of them. And this happens for either sigma s or sigma c. So let's just look at the picture here. In this picture, uh, again, we have the same uh, picture of all the uh, g-stable valuations. And in this case, the three uh, uh, co-dimension uh, two orbits are in the at the ends of some uh, rays of the diagram, and the, oh, the, the one-dimensional orbit is all the rest. All right. Now, here, uh, I'll just look at what happens. Well, okay, well, let me just go back down once. Okay, so either I could switch these two and fix this one, or I can fix all three of them. Um, now, it's interesting to note that if I look at the homogeneous case, I also have two choices in each case, but one has to be careful about a difference that happens. I'll look just at the case of the, the split case. For the split case, the open orbit admits two inequivalent G sigma S forms. 
One of them does not extend because it doesn't allow you to fix any of the rays. But I have two different uh, uh, forms on the almost homogeneous one. They come from two equivalent G sigma S forms on the open orbit, but that extend to non-equivalent ones on the almost homogeneous space. So one does have to be careful about how it works. So with this, I, I just gave you two examples, but we can do, oh, well, yeah, I should finish here. The, the real fixed points in this example, in the two examples, you can see that they're different because one of them has P1R three times and the other one has P1R cross a sphere. So these are not, they're not diffeomorphic, so they come from two different forms. So one can um, use this method of looking at the action on the projective line and seeing what it does to the, the, this, the star formation to find all real structures on SL2C almost homogeneous varieties of dimension three. Um, just a few words about this. I, in, in this, uh, first of all, I, in order to do this, I used the, um, the notation of Luna and Voost using the star theory. Timashev has another way of looking at the SL2 or, or, or complexity one varieties like this one using hypercodes. It looks a little bit more like the case of toric varieties with fans. Um, I chose this, the Luna Voost uh, representation because the, the action of gamma becomes uh, visible in an easy way of just saying permuting the rays of the diagram. Um, finally, I would, would like to say that um, this example of SL2 almost, almost homogeneous varieties is kind of where we started. We were interested in this case for several reasons. First of all, because um, in the theory of, of, of these, these almost homogeneous varieties, we find many varieties that have been previously studied. There are Fano three folds, there are P1 bundles over Hirzebruch surface and many others. And we, we were trying to systematically find all the real structures of these different varieties. And we could do that in this way. Also, we find interesting phenomena like uh, uh, questions of what happens in the non-projective case that can be completely determined by this case uh, in, a, in a systematic way. So the SL2 case is, is of particular interest. Uh, however, it can also be done much more generally and look at other complex one uh, varieties and, and do the same thing um, using the Luna Vust classification. So to close, the idea is you have a uh, if you have a almost homogeneous variety, you can find all of what all of the forms on the open set, and then knowing whether they extend comes from giving the classification of Luna Vust and the action of gamma in by gamma, and then one can see what uh, what are the what are all the K forms on the um, on the given uh, almost homogeneous space. And I thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? I have a question. Yes. Just, uh, so basically, um, I mean, if, if you look at uh, uh, action of G on the several many products of copies of G mod P. Yeah. Like you fix G mod P and you take several many copies of G mod P times G mod P. And, and so you assume that you have a generically transitive action. Is it easy then to describe all the forms? Um, wait, so so, G so generically, generic for generically transitive actions, for generically say, multiple transitive actions. Uh, okay. Uh, G it's, 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 it's like this example with SL2 acting on. Yeah. Uh, of... 
Oh no, it's not homogeneous because you've got the open sets there. Yes, so you you, you get an open orbit, and then yes, you get but, an open but, orbit. Well, I think well, you okay. In what generality do you want? I well, I mean, if if you because because those guys they're classified right by Popov, and, right? Uh -huh. And so I'm just wondering because it's an easy example, it's an easy case. Uh -huh. Will you get a comp easy easy answer to that? Uh, so G over B. So G acts on the products of several many copies of G mod P. Okay. Um, that I would tend to think that the same kind of thing will happen that I did in this case for SL2. You're right. Um, one has to be careful. First of all, you can have singularities, but that's okay. That's no problem. Um, because you're looking, so uh, yeah, because you want to look, yeah, what do you want to look at? You want to look at a closure of an orbit in there? Because you, you, know, if you, you So want my, to... my variety is just a product of several many copies so, of G. So it's, it's not, so you, you're just looking at a G variety. It's not an almost homogeneous variety at all. No, no, I, see, I assume that there exists an open orbit. So I only take those. So generically transitive. Okay, okay. so, and, and also it's, tra it's transitive. But whatever. I, mean, okay. I would have to. I would have not to. Not too many copies. Yeah, not too many. <laughs> of course, of course. I mean, there is a bound, right? <laughs> okay, and you could do G manual P instead of G manual B to make it run. You could do that too. I would have to check, but it. Well, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Mikai knows something about that. But, um, yeah, I don't know offhand. Okay. Good question. <laughs> Look at that. Any other questions? Okay, but I mean, or maybe only Zoriana has questions. <laughs> uh, is, is your work uh, related with the work of uh, Knopf and uh, Krolls? Um, uh, and recent work? Uh, no, no, I, I mean that of, of uh, four years ago. You know, uh, uh, not I'm not in the sense that we're I mean I I don't th does Knopf work over oh oh he, no he does something else he looks at okay I kind of remember what he does uh, he he looks at real cases and one of the things that's important to him is looking at real points what are the real fixed points in this story that that we're talking about these varieties can have real fixed points they can, the real fixed points can be empty it's it's uh, it's a little bit different than that that situation that he's looking. Okay. At. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again. So, thank you, everybody. So we will resume in a week. And we're thinking of continuing next term as well yes <laughs> yeah that's so we'll uh we'll see everyone next week okay <laughs>